Well, I wanted to talk about the lunar eclipse that is coming the evening before King Charles III's coronation ceremony. And it will be on the evening of May 5th. And at that time, Rabbi Ephraim Mervis that was knighted by King Charles III, and he will be spending the night over at Clarence House, the residence of King Charles III and Queen Consort Camilla. And the lunar eclipse will be happening above them. It should be visible, I believe, in the UK. I wanted to discuss this lunar eclipse simply for the fact that People really don't know much about it, but also for the fact that when I started looking at it, it just happened to connect to some things I just talked about in my story about the man of sin and how the man of sin, you know, there was temples that were dedicated to this false god, the crescent moon god, sin, and he supposedly in mythology had children, one of which those children was Enlil that I talked about in that last video on revealing the man of sin. And this just happens to be information about Babylon and everything that is being discussed about this particular lunar eclipse. It just happens to coincide. So I was really shocked and I decided to share this info this is more convincing information for you about the identity of, you know, what's coming about the king who's going to sit upon the throne in the last days as the world leader. While some view the prospect of witnessing an eclipse as an exciting and fascinating scientific phenomenon, the sages of Israel, Gamera, had a deeper perspective. Now, I wanted to read this. This is why the rabbis thought that a lunar eclipse was a bad omen. And this was written by a rabbi, Dr. Moshe Friedman, July 27th of 2018. Okay, so it says... According to the Gemara, an eclipse is a bad omen for the Jewish people, with some sages extending the warning to include all of humanity. The Gemara adds one caveat, though. When the people perform God's will, they need not be afraid of any of these omens. Nevertheless, a solar or lunar eclipse is a predictable cosmological phenomenon. So why should the alignment of the sun, moon, and earth have any negative spiritual effect at all? Well, we know that the, that the moon and the reflection of the sun on the moon affects the ocean tides on the earth. So obviously these things do have an effect on the earth. Accordingly, some have attacked the Jewish sages, assuming that they've copied the superstitions about lunar and solar eclipses that were prevalent in ancient times. American scientist Dr. Judith Landra writes that these statements are very much in keeping with the ancient world's fear and ignorance of eclipses. And she writes that in Science and Torah, page 189. But were the ancients ignorant of cosmology? Despite the prevalent superstitions, it appears that the astronomers of antiquity, both Jewish and non-Jewish, also knew how to predict an eclipse. Now, the reason for this is because there were no clocks back then. And in order to navigate on the oceans, they had to go by the movement and the, the uh, placement of certain star formations, planetary formations and where they were in the sky to navigate. It was an ancient navigating system. So it wasn't just superstition. They were really well versed on the positions of these planets and stars and how they moved and what time of season for growing crops and what was the best time to plant. Um, I've heard some Jewish people say the best time to plant your seeds is during a full moon of the moonlight 
because it does something with the soil and the seeds. So that's a very interesting view, and it's not superstition. It's something that they have discovered in ancient times that they had to depend on, you know, the weather and these heavenly signs to know when to do certain things. Now we have the convenience of, you know, telling time on a clock and, you know, people already know what the best time of the year is to plant crops and everything. And to navigate, you know, with the nautical system. So, despite the prevalent superstitions, it appears that the astronomers of antiquity, both Jewish and non-Jewish, also knew how to predict an eclipse. The Chaldeans and Babylonians left behind clay tablets, such as the Mullapin tablets, which describe exactly how their priests, such as Nabu Remani, the priest of the moon god, were able to accurately predict each eclipse by observing the orbits of the moon and planets. So this is exactly what I was talking about. This Nabu is another name for this crescent moon god. So very interesting of this connection to the lunar eclipse. The study of astronomy was also considered important to the Jewish sages. The Mishnic sage Rabbi Eliezer ben Kizma held that astronomy and mathematics were essential adjuncts to Torah study. The Gemara, in fact, notes that there is a duty to calculate the orbits of the planets. The Second Temple Galilean sage, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, studied astronomy and geometry among many other secular subjects. The sages who had established communities and centers of learning in Babylon, following the exile from the land of Israel, also professed a keen knowledge of the celestial spheres and their movements. So it's telling you that Babylon was one of the centers of the crescent moon god sin worship. Smuel boasts that the paths of the heavens are as well known to me as the streets of Nehardia, the Babylonian town in which he lived, except for comets, for I do not know what they are, he wrote. He is known as Shmuel Yarkina, meaning Samuel the Moon expert. The last Lubavitcher, Rebbe, also notes that the wise men of Egypt and Babylonia created tablets of upcoming eclipses, and it is known from our own holy texts that our sages consulted with these wise men. Okay, well, the ancient Jewish men from the land of Israel, the Hebrews, were called wise men. They were the sages of old. This is why I believe that the wise men were Jewish and they knew when to expect the Messiah and they came when Jesus was born because they knew the time that Daniel prophesied for his arrival had come. They traveled. They were the wise men. They were Jewish sages and they figured it out. They saw his star in the east and it was all prophesied in Ephrata, Bethlehem, and this is why Herod tried to get it out of them what the, you know, um, foretelling of the Messiah, the king, was because he was afraid he was known as the king of the Jews and he thought he was going to be replaced. So they depended on you know, counting the days according to the Torah, and they knew when the time was that he should arrive. But with all this in mind, how could the same sages who knew so much about astronomy and predicted astronomical events ascribe apparently superstitious significance to them? Shekinah glory that shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And just like when God's divine presence descended, it stood at the um, tent of meeting, and just like it came and stood at the place, the cave, where the Messiah was born.
This is all of what I revealed in my video about the Star of Bethlehem and its true identity. So that's in another video around the holidays that I loaded. But it's very clear that these ancients were very well adept of what was happening in the heavens and that it was significant. The Lubavitcher Rebbe likens an eclipse to a rainbow, which is also a natural phenomenon, but still serves as a divine message. So that's going to be extremely important, leading to the coronation of King Charles III. It is a divine message. This idea resonates with the original Gemara in Sukkah, which stated that when we perform God's will, we need not to be afraid of these omens. Yet this still doesn't resolve the fact that unlike the rainbow, the eclipse is predictable. Why should a predictable event serve as a sign to do God's will? But within the question lies the answer. It is precisely because an eclipse is natural and predictable that it serves as a warning. Keep that in mind. Human beings are an admixture of physical and spiritual. According to Genesis, we are created from both physical matter, the dust of the earth, together with the life breath of God, our spiritual godly essence, in Genesis 2.7. We therefore have a temporal physical body and an eternal spiritual soul. God's mitzvot allow us to connect with the divine and invest in the eternal aspect of ourselves. It is natural for humans to seek pleasure and instant gratification from the physical world, and conversely it is unnatural to resist it. But God's divine will is that we should refine and channel our physical desires into more holy pursuits. Simply put, the performance of God's will helps us to better ourselves and transcend the physical world of instant gratification. If we succeed, God protects and provides for us measure for measure by breaking the laws of nature and performing the most wondrous miracles. This is why an eclipse is seen as a bad omen, for the very fact that it is predictable shows that it is part of the natural order of the cosmos. But our choices do not need to be bound by nature. We can align them with God's will, rise above the physical, natural, cause and effect order of things, and miraculously transform ourselves to become, quite simply, supernatural. And I would say, as we trust in the Holy Spirit to perform His works and deeds through our lives. Now, if you'd like to see the eclipse, you can log on to rmg.co.uk, the Royal Observatory, Visit the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, London, home of Greenwich Mean Time, GMT, the prime meridian of the world, and London's planetarium. All of the clocks and everything is all succinct with this time in London, Royal Observatory. Now, interestingly, this totally connects to this um, Mesopotamian area where I talked about the man of sin. And I just cannot believe that this connects with a video that I just created about that. But humans have been alternatively amused, puzzled, bewildered, and sometimes even terrified at the sight of this celestial phenomenon. A range of social and cultural reactions accompanies the observation of an eclipse. In ancient Mesopotamia, roughly modern Iraq, and that's where Babylon is in modern-day Iraq, ancient Babylon. Eclipses were, in fact, regarded as omens. Can you believe this connects to ancient Babylon? As signs of things to come. So they were regarded as omens, as signs of things to come. So we need to pay attention to the lunar eclipse the evening before King Charles III's coronation because Jerusalem is Mystery Babylon and I explained that in prior videos if you're new to the channel and you haven't watched it please don't leave comments that you know unless you watch that and you understand where I'm coming from on that
because I'm not going to go into it on this video, but I did in another video. For an eclipse to take place, three celestial bodies must find themselves in a straight line within their ecliptic orbits. This is called a Szyski, from the Greek word zuzogos, meaning yoked or paired. That's interesting too. From our viewpoint on Earth, there are two kinds of eclipses, solar and lunar. In a solar eclipse, the moon passes in between the sun and Earth, which results in blocking our view of the sun. In a lunar eclipse, which is what's going to happen before the coronation, it is the moon that crosses through the shadow of the Earth. A solar eclipse can completely block our view of the sun, but it is usually a brief event and can be observed only in certain areas of the Earth's surface. What can be viewed as a total eclipse is one's hometown may just be a partial eclipse a few hundred miles away. Now listen to this connection to Babylon. More than 2,000 years ago, the Babylonians were able to calculate that there were 38 possible eclipses within a period of 223 months. That is about 18 years. This period of 223 months is called a Soros. That sounds just like George Soros. His has S-A-U-R-O-S and this is S-A-R-O-S. It's called a Soros cycle by modern astronomers and a sequence of eclipses separated by a Soros cycle constitutes a Soros series. Although scientists now know that the number of lunar and solar eclipses is not exactly the same in every sorrow series, one cannot underplay the achievement of Babylonian scholars in understanding this astronomical phenomenon. Their realization of this cycle eventually allowed them to predict the occurrence of an eclipse. The level of astronomical knowledge achieved in ancient Babylonia, southern Mesopotamia, cannot be separated from the astrological tradition that regarded eclipses as omens. Astronomy and astrology were then two sides of the same coin. There were rituals to preempt royal fate. Now this is really interesting. According to Babylonian scholars, eclipses could foretell the death of the king. The conditions for an omen to be considered as such were not simple. For instance, according to a famous astronomical work known by its initial words, Enuma Anu Enlil, when the gods Enu and Enlil if Jupiter was visible during the eclipse, the king was safe. That's because Jupiter's the king planet. But it was also another name for the abomination of desolation. Lunar eclipses seem to have been a particular concern for the well-being and survival of the king. Now this just blew me away because I just talked about the man of sin and this person, Enlil, that's claimed to be a god, was in mythology a child of the man of sin, the crescent moon god Sin. So this all had to do with the safety of the king at the time of his coronation. In order to preempt the monarch's fate, a mechanism was devised, the substitute king ritual. There are over 30 mentions of this ritual in various letters from Assyria and what I had said was that was a place of crescent moon worship of the man of sin. So if you have a modern king that embraces the crescent moon god sin, he is embracing this ancient uh, form of worship that does go back to Assyria which became Syria which is northern Mesopotamia, dating to the first millennia BC. Earlier references to a similar ritual have also been found in texts in Hittite, the Indo-European language for which we have the earliest written records, dating to second millennium Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. 
saving the king. In this ritual, person would be chosen to replace the king. He would be dressed like the king and placed on the throne to avoid confusion with a real coronation. All this would occur alongside the recitation of the negative omen triggered by the observation of the eclipse. Can you believe this is what they believed back then? And now we've got this lunar eclipse prior to the coronation of King Charles III? Wow! This is really something. So this is why I wanted to share it with you because it kind of blew me away. But the real king would keep a low profile and avoid being seen. If no additional negative portents were observed, the substitute king was put to death therefore fulfilling the prophetic reading of the celestial omen while saving the life of the real king. This ritual would take place when an eclipse was observed or even predicted something that became possible to do in later periods. The presence of this ritual among the corpus of Hittite texts in the second millennium, Anatolia has led to the assumption that it must have existed already in Mesopotamia during the first half of the second millennium BC. There is a legend, although omens predicting the death of the king are already known for this earlier period, the truth is that the main basis for such an assumption is that an interesting story preserved only in a much later first millennium composition known by modern scholars as the Chronicle of the Early Kings. According to this late chronicle, a king of the city of Isin, which is interesting, Isin, probably named after the man of sin, the uh, crescent moon god Sin, a king of the city of Isin, it's south of Baghdad by 125 miles southeast. Era Imidi was replaced by a gardener named Enlil Banai as part of a substitute king ritual. Now Enlil was the son of the crescent moon god Sin. So he was replaced, I mean he was put in place as part of a substitute king ritual. Luckily for this gardener, the real king died while eating hot soup, so the gardener remained on the throne and became king for good. The fact is that these two kings, Era Imidi and Enlil Benai, did exist and reigned successfully in Isin during the 19th century BC. The story, however, as told in the late Chronicle of the Early Kings, bears all the trademarks of a legend. The story was probably devised to explain a dynastic switch in which the royal office passed from one family or lineage to another instead of following the usual father-son line of succession. The complexity of human events is rarely constrained and determined by one single factor. Nevertheless, whether in ancient Mesopotamia or early China, eclipses and other omens provided contemporary justifications or after-the-fact explanations for an entangled set of variables that decided a specific course of history. Even if they mix astronomy and astrology or history with legend, humans have been preoccupied with the inescapable anomaly embodied by an eclipse for as long as they have looked at the sky. Now this was written by Euro.Isuero.com. Coronation of King Charles III and a lunar eclipse. Will they bring back the ritual of death and sacrifice? Upon the death of Queen Elizabeth II, which occurred September 28, 2022, her son will take her place as Charles III. However, there has been much speculation about the day of his coronation, which has been set for May 6th. Lunar Eclipse 2023, it will overlap with the coronation as it will occur on May 5th, but many already speculate that these two actions with the coronation have a ritual from many years ago. This goes back to scholars, Babylonians who believe that eclipses predict the death of a king and specifically are with lunar eclipses. Now I want to say something about that in case people start saying William's the one or Harry's the one. Charles is the one and 
what this could signify is that if he is the man of sin, the Antichrist character, then it will end with his death because Jesus will come and put an end to those kingdoms. So I'm just saying that that's probably what it's referring to, not that he's going to die before the coronation or anything. But in order for this prediction not to come true, a ritual of sacrifice so that the king could be saved and protected. The ritual is that at the time of the eclipse, the uh, royalty symbolically abdicated his position and some other person would be chosen to pose as king during those moments in which this phenomenon is. However, they would sacrifice the supposed king, an act that would serve to protect the real king. Despite this coincidence, many point out that this event could occur and be inspired by this ritual. The rise of Charles III as king of the United Kingdom will surely continue the coronation tradition, but could this be a bad omen showing that the time of Jacob's trouble is at hand? and that he's going to rule for the seven years and it's going to come to an end and he is going to be judged. That is, if he turns away from the gospel in the oath and incorporates the crescent moon god sin and all of these other pagan idol religions. Could the penumbral lunar eclipse be a bad omen for King Charles's coronation? That the coronation coincides with the blood moon lunar eclipse? Yes, the king's big day falls on the day immediately after a prenumbral lunar eclipse hits our skies the evening before. And according to TikTok, this could be a time of great concern. The king's coronation coincides with a lunar eclipse, and TikTokers are theorizing that it could be a sign of bad things to come owing to the significance of eclipses in astrology of ancient times. One TikToker surmises that eclipses in early history were associated with rulers, and according to Babylonian scholars, eclipses could foretell the death of a king, and lunar eclipses in particular were times of great concern for the current king in power. And she adds that elaborate sacrificial rituals would take place at times of eclipse in order to protect the king. These would entail another person impersonating the king ready to be sacrificed straight after. Yikes! <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if something significant happened during the coronation or within the royal family during that time, the TikToker concludes. So these signs in the skies were put there by God and he said that he put them as you know signs and warnings to us so I just wanted to tell you that this is going to happen the evening preceding the coronation of King Charles the third